It's Tuesday, December 13th, 2022. This is a late afternoon edition of The Bullpen with Adam the Bull. I uh, had a crazy morning today, so we're getting to the podcast a little late. I'm glad I did because we had some breaking news later than the time I normally report the podcast, record the podcast. It is a 4.34 Tuesday afternoon, and the Guardians make a... Is it a significant move? I still got to think about that. It's a move. It improved the team. So I'll say it's significant. Uh, we will also get to some injury news involving the Browns that broke this afternoon with four games to go. Our guys going to start jumping off the ship? And the Cavaliers lose to the Spurs on the road on Monday night. That's all coming up on this Tuesday edition of the Bullpen with Adam the Bull. Podcast is not for the faint of heart. And I do think it's time for the Browns to move on. It's not for those who ride the fence. He's proven nothing. But if you're looking for someone who tells it like it is about Cleveland sports. Everybody does fandom their way. You've come to the right place. I don't think he's any good. It's time for the bullpen with Adam the Bull. Bow, 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 bow. I can't get enough of that music. So on Monday, well, let's go back. Um, when the offseason began, we talked about the Guardians. I had four things on my to-do list for the Guardians. Number one, a first baseman slash DH that could play every day, who would be an upgrade from, from Owen Miller, a significant upgrade. Uh, Josh Bell wasn't my first choice. But it was a good choice. He's a significant upgrade for, for Owen Miller. Check. Uh, my, sec, my second thing was catcher. We're going to get back to that in a minute. My third thing was another guy who can play first base DH that can hit lefties and hopefully play defense, but most importantly hit lefties. That hasn't been done yet, but still on the table, hopefully. And my fourth thing was get a starting pitcher to add to the middle of the rotation, a third, fourth starter. I think the Guardians will still do something in that vein. Haven't done it yet, but hopefully they will. That could include a couple of former Indian slash Guardians players in Carlos Carrasco via trade or Corey Kluber uh, via free agency. I'm interested in both of those guys. Noah Syndergaard, Wade Miley, Johnny Cueto, all other possibilities I'd like to see added to the middle of this rotation to lengthen it out. So let's get back to catcher, which along with the first baseman were the two most important things for this team to do. Heading into the offseason, it felt like Sean Murphy was the guy to get. Sean Murphy is a ascending young catcher with Oakland, a team that was willing to move on from him. Three years of control, probably reasonable money, a good all-around player, good defensive player, has some power, hits for average, gets on base. A good a top 10 all-around catcher. The Guardians were supposedly in talks uh, for him during the season at the trade deadline and once again this offseason. Unfortunately, it didn't come to be. Yesterday, they, he was traded as part of a three-team team deal to the Braves. Uh, from the baseball people, the inside baseball people that I read and one that I know, uh, the A's didn't get a very good trade, so it had me scratching my head. I was a little disappointed. I think the Guardians could have made a stronger offer, but okay. So... Obviously, Wilson Contreras signed with the Cardinals. He was never, my assumption is he was never on the Guardians' radar because they don't sign long-term, big-money free agent contracts. So the third guy on the list was Christian Vasquez, who's a good, solid catcher, not as good as Murphy, not as good as Contreras, but still a good, solid guy. You know, upgrade as a hitter, hits for a decent average, has a little power, you know, okay fielder. He went off the board board on a three-year contract yesterday to division rival Minnesota. So after those moves happened, the remaining catcher market, unless the Blue Jays are going to trade a guy, and to get Alejandro Kirk, who I really like, was going to take a ton, even more than for Murphy because he's under team control for five years. Uh, Could have got maybe made a trade for Danny Jansen, but I think even that, the asking price might have been high. So for so. The Blue Jay, the the Guardians did not go down that route either. The rest of the free agent catchers were guys with question marks, all of them. Um, and 
yesterday, I put out a tweet yesterday afternoon. I said, you know, a guy who might make some sense on a short-term deal is Mike Zanino. Now, Mike Zanino has been a guy that has played, uh, f- played he's been in the league for 10 years, uh, played for Seattle for six years and the last four in Tampa. And so he's, especially in the last four years in Tampa, although he's missed some time due to injury, uh, he has he has caught some good pitchers. He led some good pitching staffs. In fact, he was a, a not, not only an All Star in 2021, but finished 20th in the voting for MVP in the 2021 season. Had an OPS of 860, 33 homers, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, am I is is Mike Zanino like Gary Sanchez or any of these other guys on the free agent market right now going to get me excited? No. Um, does Mike Zanino have major flaws in his game? Absolutely. But this idea that the Guardians have not upgraded from Austin Hedges is wrong. Uh, Mike Zanino is a significantly better player. Now, what are his positives and what are his negatives? Let's start with the positives. He He is a significant, he has a lot of power. Mike Zanino has played over 100 games five times in his career. 2014, 2015, 2017, 2018, and 2021. The reason he's played the, that few games some of those years is because he's had some injury issues. That's a negative. But in the five years that he's played 100 games, um, he had, and he, in those five seasons, he's had at least three, 375 plate appearances. So in the five seasons where he's had at least uh, 375 plate appearances, he has hit at least 20 home runs in four of those five years and in the last three. And in fact, in, in his last three uh, seasons of, a hun- of 375 or more plate appearances, um, he has hit 33, 20, and 25 home runs. So Zanino, in those last three seasons, that's 78 home runs in about 1,200 trips to the plate. That is a good home run percentage. Very good. Uh, he's not only good at hitting home runs, he gets you know plenty of extra base hits. If you compare it to Austin Hedges, okay, um, Mike Zanino has been around longer. Mike Zanino has, uh, let's see. 957 more plate appearances. Roughly, Austin Hedges has been to the plate about 2,000 times, and Mike Zanino's been to the plate just under 3,000 times. So Mike Zanino has about 48, 49% more plate appearances. And yet, he has over 100%, he has about 110% more home runs and 110% more extra base hits. If you have a 700 career OPS, that's average. Now, I don't have the OPS averages for catcher, but my guess is that the average that for catchers, the average OPS, my guess is probably somewhere between 650 and 675, and that might be high. Mike Zanino's career OPS is 681. That's certainly not great. It's below average for an overall hitter, for a catcher, my guess is it's average to slightly above average. Austin Hedges' career OPS is 578, including a insanely awful 489 last year. Austin Hedges is the worst hitter in baseball. Mike Zanino's other flaw. He don't hit for an average. His career batting average is 200. And if you only look at one statistic, you're going to say, well, he's just as bad as Austin Hedges. Well, as bad as his batting average is at 200 for a career, Austin Hedges is even worse. Hedges' career on base percentage is a hideous 247. Zanino's is a bad 271. But slugging is the difference. He has, Zanino has a good slugging percentage of 410. That's solid. That's very good. Austin Hedges, 
331. That's not good. So while flawed, and while not as good as Murphy or Contreras or even Vasquez as an all-around player, Mike Zanino is a significant upgrade from Austin Hedges. Now, last year he only played 36 games. He was awful in those 36 games. He he did not hit from, he only had eight extra base hits in 123 plate appearances. And maybe he's going off the cliff at age 31. But there's little risk here at one year, $6 million. Now, I understand there's some frustration because we thought we were going to get a significant, significant upgrade at the position. And while he's significant, it's not, like if you had gone to Murphy or Contreras, that's a, like a, a I'm beyond significant. That's a massive upgrade at the position. But this is still an upgrade, I believe, unless, again, you never know when a guy goes off the cliff. Low risk at $6 million for one year. But what it tells me is that the Guardians believe Bo Naylor is their cor- is their catcher of the future. That they believe in him. Because they had the prospects to beat what the A's got, in, in my opinion. Now listen, every, just because I don't think the A's got a lot, or a lot of the baseball world doesn't think the A's got a lot, they must think they got a lot. Everybody evaluates things differently. So... Just because, so, so maybe they, maybe the Guardians couldn't make a better offer, but I doubt it. I think the Guardians could have. They chose not to. They could have uh, uh, gone after one of the Blue Jays catchers. They chose not to. They could have even signed uh, Vasquez, who is not in the Murphy Contreras category, but is uh, is probably halfway between those guys and Zanino. Those guys are up here. Those guys are up here. Right, and then Vasquez is here, and then Zanino's here, and then Hedges, you can't even see him. He's off the table. But they went with Zanino, a cheap option, because I assume, you could just assume, well, they're cheap, they don't want to spend money. That's part of it, sure, I can't disagree. But I I, I do believe there's got to be some level of we have faith in Bo Naylor. And I think if Bo Naylor has a good spring training, then he will start the season on the major league roster in split time with Zanino. As I said, Zanino's had injuries. He missed most of last year. Um, you know, he's he's like I said, he's only played five five seasons of more than a hundred games, and he's never played more than 131 in a season, and that was back in 2014. So there's you're gonna need somebody else for a minimum of 50, 60 games. And hopefully that's Bo Naylor. If he's not quite ready. We'll see what they do. Uh, they did bring in a veteran. Uh, I can't remember how to pronounce his name. Mibris Viloria. I think is how you say it. They got him. He had been with the Royals. They could always bring him in or another veteran backup catcher for minimal money. But I think in a perfect world, Zanino is, ke- keeps the power stroke. And he had 33 homers in 2021. 33 homers in 375 trips to the plate. That's got to be one of the best home run ratios of 2021. If he could just if he could hit 200 with 20 something tw- high 20s homers knocking 60 runs I'll take it especially cuz he's only going to play 100 games and maybe less maybe he plays 80 90 maybe Bo Naylor plays in a perfect world they split it Bo Naylor st- starts to show you why they decided to have faith in him then you let Zanino walk next year you bring in even a cheaper veteran to back up Naylor and Naylor becomes your primary catcher. I think that's what they've done here. Now we'll just wait and see what else they're going to do. Because that can't be it. They do need another hitter and another pitcher. And I'll tell you what. I mentioned this on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show today. I would really love to see the Guardians. They have all these prospects. They haven't made the big trade we keep expecting them to make for the last two years. There's – you look at the at the Pittsburgh Pirates – they have an outfielder by the name of Brian. Oh, I can't. I just forget his name. Uh, what the hell is wrong with me? Brian. What? Brian Reynolds. <laughs> his last name for a second. Brian Reynolds. That's why I was stolen because I couldn't think of his last name and it was just not coming to me. Brian Reynolds is 27 years old. I just want to double check how many years of team control he has left. He has two years of team control. He's going to make six. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he has more than that. He has three years of team control left. Even better. Uh, he's going to make six point seven five million this year. The guy um, 
was an all-star in 2021. Now, he didn't have quite as good a year last year, but this is a guy who can do it all. Uh, he's got good power. He has an 842 career OPS. I mean, like, the numbers are really... Brian Reynolds is an all-star caliber player. And he finished 11th for the National League MVP in 2021. Last year, still a good year. Does You know, last two years, he's played in all but uh, 20, 20 games. Last two years. In fact, he's never really missed time due to injury. Came up early in the season, played 134 games in 19. In 2020, missed five games in a 60-game season. Missed two games in 21 and missed 17 last year. So the guy's been healthy as an ox. He has three years left of team control. He's a great player. He's a um, good defensive player. I, I know outfield is not an obvious need, but, man, would it be sweet to bring in Brian Reynolds, another young player. Um, you know, he he strikes out like a lot of guys do, but not at an absurd amount. And he's, you know, last year, last uh, is a career 361 on base. I mean, he gets on base, he hits for a good average. He would fit in great with this team, and he's just 27 years old. Uh, he's about to turn 28 next month. But you'd have him for his age 28, 29, and 30 seasons. If I'm the Guardians, that's the guy I'm going to go after. I-, I think he's tremendous. And, you know, then what you could do is you're out, your, pri- your primary outfield would be Reynolds, Straw, and Quan, which would be extremely strong defensively and on the corners offensively. You use uh, basically what you do is between Straw, Oscar Gonzalez, uh, you play Reynolds and Quan every day, and Bell most days. But between Straw, Oscar Gonzalez, and Naylor, you split. You know you, those guys get. 320 ga- 350 games between them. You know, two guys plus the extra pickup. You can, you can never have enough good bats. And I, and I, I again, while outfield is not an obvious need, I think Brian Reynolds would just be a sensational move for the Guardians. They have the prospects to go get him. He wants out of Pittsburgh. He's in the prime of his career. He's He'll have three years of team. I mean, there's no reason for the Guardians not to attack Brian Reynolds and go after him. That would really be so exciting if they did that. I have no idea if they're talking to the Pirates at all, but I would be over the moon uh, if if the Guardians were able to acquire Brian Reynolds. Uh, all right, that will leave the Guardians there for now. I'll take a break. when When I come back, I want to talk about the Browns a little bit. And some injuries piling up as we head to the final four games. Uh, BetOnline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and World Cup. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline where the game starts. Okay, so today, this afternoon, it was announced that um, Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa would miss the rest of the season due to injury. Uh, The Browns will be without their top four linebackers for the rest of the season. Um, if you look at, you know, obviously the other guys have been gone already. We lost, you lost um, Tsioni Taki Taki, Anthony Walker. So the list goes on and on. Now, um, I do think it's interesting that it feels like to some degree the Browns, re- they're still mathematically alive for the playoffs, but it's such a remote chance. Even if they win out, they would have they have a 4% chance of making the playoffs. So, And that's if they win out, which is I don't think that likely at this point. They got a good shot to go 3-1. and one. But so another guy, and, and I think at this point the Browns need to focus on getting guys, guys ready for next year. I talked about this a little bit on the show. 
James Hudson should be starting at right tackle the rest of the season. There's no reason to play Jack Conklin. He spoke today as if he was moving on. They're going to let him go. Uh, Clowney's banged up, by the way. Clowney, Bell, Cooper, and Miles Garrett all did not practice today. We'll, we'll monitor Miles Garrett to see if they shut him down. He probably doesn't want to be. Uh, John, John Johnson, uh, Najoku, and Ward also limited in practice today. Uh, Miles Garrett's not going to want to be shut down, but at some point, the Browns might make the decision to do that. Um, in terms of who they're playing this week, they'll play the Ravens, obviously. The Browns are favored in this game. I mentioned that, uh, I think, on yesterday's podcast, which first surprised me. But obviously, Lamar Jackson's not playing. They were down to the third-string quarterback um, uh, last week. Now, it, uh, it looks like Tyler Huntley might be able to play this week. He was he did practice today, so at least they'll be back to their second string quarterback. I think uh, Browns are a two and a half point favorite at home. Remember they play Saturday this week at four thirty. We will have the uh, the post game show, the, the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show post game show here for you. Uh, myself, G. Bush, and uh, Mikey McNuggets this Saturday, probably around you know seven thirty, give or take. So. It'd be interesting to see what they do at running back. Does Jerome Ford get more action? Uh, Somebody today suggested starting to rest some of the other Brown starters like Cooper or Chubb, and you may get some of that. But ultimately, they need to get Deshaun Watson with as many reps, with as many starters as possible in preparation for next season. And Nick Chubb, who hasn't run the ball well, some on him, some on the offensive line, for whatever reason, he hasn't been very good the last couple of weeks. Some of it could be, I know G suggested on the show, it's the fact that Deshaun Watson has been played mostly in shotgun. The Browns have been a you know, a team that's run under center, and they're adjusting, and that's something they're going to have to work on. Now, you'll have all offseason, you'll have training camp in the preseason, but why not get ahead of the game? I'm not shutting down Nick Chubb, and it's not just because he's one of my fantasy teams for the playoffs. There's more to it than that. I do expect the Browns to play well. I expect Deshaun Watson to continue to improve. I'm leaning towards picking the Browns to win this week. I give the Ravens credit. They've managed to win two games. They weren't pretty, and the offense didn't score much. But since Lamar Jackson got hurt early in their game two weeks ago, I think the Denver, they held on. They beat the Steelers this past week, and they obviously you know, don't have that tough a schedule the rest of the way. But I think the Browns are going to play well. Selfishly, I hope they win because, obviously, I want the Bengals to get the uh, win the division over the Ravens. But as, a, as a, a Browns supporter as well, I want them to win for that reason, of course, too. And I just think, I think um, there have been enough – well, there's clearly been some negative. I think there's enough positive signs for Deshaun Watson. And as much as I didn't think he played that well in Game 2, it was certainly a significant step up from Week 1 – and with the talent he has, I think he's going to now quickly move. And I think we could see, uh, you know, I, I gave him an F for his first game. I gave him a C- minus for his second game. I think we'll get a B to B-plus effort this week from Deshaun Watson. I, I'm ex- or at least that's what I'm expecting. All right, one final break. Come back, uh, do a little calves and a few other things to wrap things up. Next, right here in the bullpen with Adam the Bull. Okay, Cavaliers with a really poor performance on Monday night. They go down big early in the, like at the end of the first half, and they've had these. And it was a huge run by the Spurs, twenty-four to three or something. I can't remember exactly what it was in the second quarter. But Cavs got outscored thirty-six twenty-two in the second quarter. They did play well in the fourth and made it a one-point game and had chances to win. Couldn't get it done. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, after the game, admitted that they took the Spurs lightly. I, I credit him for admitting that, and I think he's been a, a very good leader. But on the other hand, um, we can't have that. The Cavs have proven nothing. They've played well overall through 28 games, and they played well overall last season. But they haven't won a playoff game without LeBron James in two decades. This team has proven nothing. They can't take anybody lightly. 
and I know we had Serena Winters on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show today, and she said, you know, it happens all the time in the NF- in the NBA, and I get it. Yes, this, that's true. But the other teams that do it quite often are teams that are proven. I get that. I The, the Cavs are still proving themselves, and as Serena mentioned, JB's thinking like I am. Two great minds think alike. They have no right to take anybody lightly. Donovan Mitchell uh, did play well in this game, 28 points, five rebounds. He shot 50% from the field, but he and Darius Garland struggled from the three-point line. They um, they combined to go three of 13 from three. And that was, you know, 13 of the 28. Karis LeVert, Kevin, nobody made more than one. Well, Mitchell made two, two of seven. But uh, Darius struggling shooting at the moment. He did have uh, seven rebounds and nine assists. He had 18, Evan Mobley at 17 and 13, Jared Allen 16 and 7 in the game, and Karis LeVert did have 23 off the bench. He shot well overall, 9 of 13. The Cavs shot it well from two, but from three they were terrible. They were 40 of 69 from three. I mean, that's uh, from two. That's over 50%. Uh, but uh, 5 of 23 from three, 16 of 17 from the line, but the one big miss by Mobley. Otherwise, it could have gone to overtime. It is what it is. Uh, Cavaliers have been bad on the road, as we know. They continue their road trip in Dallas. They're still staying in Texas for a game with Dallas tomorrow, 9 p.m., before they come back for a six-game homestand starting Friday. Indiana, Dallas, Utah, Milwaukee, Toronto, Brooklyn. That is a hell of a homestand with some really good teams. It's going to be interesting to check that out. Speaking of checking it out, uh, welcome uh, on the TV report here. Welcome to Chippendales. Yes, the story of how Chippendales was started. Don't be uptight, people. Guys, don't be uptight. Be comfortable with yourself enough. It's a very interesting story about how it was started in an odd way, and there's murder involved and all kinds of things. So it's really worth watching. I've watched four episodes. The fifth episode just became available today, and there'll be three more. It's a really good show. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. All right. Thanks for joining me, as always, on this Tuesday. Um, I'm going to have my man Cleve T.A. on Friday's show. I'm looking forward to his debut in the bullpen. Make sure you become a subscriber to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Hit the alert bell, and every time I put out a podcast or we do put out any podcast from the show or do an overtime show or an extra inning show or whatever the hell it is, breaking news, you will get an alert. Uh, consider becoming a member of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. For $4.99 a month, less than $60 a year, you will get bonus content uh, almost every day. We didn't do a, a bonus uh, segment today, but almost every day we will do a bonus segment of at least 10 minutes, and you'll get that exclusive content plus a few other things. And uh, make sure you check out my website, adamthebull.com, on Twitter at Adam the Bull, and at Cameo Adam the Bull as well. Talk to you tomorrow. Where else? Right here in the bullpen with Adam the Bull. See ya.